So, Jerome, uh, two rate cuts, right? As Tom Lee would say. And Jerome Powell would probably look at him being like, what on earth are you talking about? Good morning or evening, ladies and gentlemen, depending on when you're watching this. Happy Sunday to you all. And the market really doesn't care about what either of those two gentlemen actually think. The market is only going higher, fueled by the raging bear as they continue to basically try to short this market, not capitulating on their positions, actually pushing out the net speculative position publishing all the way into Monday because, you know, they, they just can't stand having a weekend of their inbox being trolled by how this market is going and how they're losing money. And we're going to be talking about the levels you guys have to look at this coming week. It is CPI week. We're going to be streaming that on Thursday and bank earnings on Friday. So the craziness is starting once again. I will obviously be playing JP Morgan City and Wells Fargo earnings with the option play. That video will be coming out on Thursday morning. So make sure you guys have the subscribe button enabled along with bell notifications so you know when that video comes out, you can play along with me in that option. And we also have our Discord link down in the description below. And while you're down there, hit the like button. It really helps the YouTube algorithm out. So going back to what happened, right? Tom Lee's expectation, and we're gonna get into his expectation for inflation, kind of the mentality of why I think he may be a little bit presumptively expecting that he's been right this whole time. So therefore, he has to be right again. And we're going to be talking about some of the kinks in the armor that could show up that derails his expectation that he quotes, and I say this, that inflation is going to fall like a rock. And that probably resembles Jerome Powell's look on his face saying like, what on earth are you smoking? But without further ado, let's talk about what happened with the market this week. Simply put it, I gave you guys option play 550, 552 spread, and that worked out absolutely magically where we said on Monday, I would like to see a little bit of a dip, kind of look at a couple of buying opportunities there, and we got it right. On Monday, we basically got the perfect buying opportunity, bounced nearly with an ascent off the 542.44 level, and if you entered anywhere close to that, right, even if you entered on the next preceding day, you still got a decent buying opportunity out there and then ran that trade to 50% profit, closing it on Thursday, not even waiting for Friday. If you're still in that trade, congratulations and you're welcome. So with further ado, let's talk about where the week's levels are going to be. And let me just clean up the chart for you guys. So just like that, here we have the levels we have to pay attention to. Again, 550 now is gonna be a rotationary point because we really do not want to see a break below consistently 550 because that would mean the trend is no longer intact. Remember, the trend is your friend till the end. We have a long way to go. However, it is a catalyzed week, so do not play 542.44 out of nowhere, right? It is still in the realm of possibility, however, how slim that may be. We would require a significant miss on CPI and or bank earnings before we necessarily get that level to be broken. First of all, we would have to break 550.12. So before all the bears start jumping down my throat, when you break 550, then you can say that we're breaking the trend and therefore we can start looking at the bearish theories. The other thing I wanted to mention is that the fear and greed index is knocking on the door of greed. We have been sitting in this fear territory buying the dip essentially during this time and now we're starting to get into greed again. So what would I be looking for if I was looking at option plays for this? I'd be looking for a debit spread because it minimizes my risk to reward, probably looking at a two week out spread and then subsequently trying to enter around the 550 mark. I would love to see 550 be retested this week prior to CPI and even maybe setting up possibly a wicking uh, option or wicking opportunity, I should say, at futures in order when CPI comes out, we wick down to 550, hit back right back up. So it could be in an aftermarket trade. If we were looking at that, obviously you can't play options during that time just because it's only during market open. But if you trade futures, that could be an interesting opportunity when they basically blow the bids and asks up during the catalyzed event. That could be something I'm gonna be looking at depending where we are. However, we're very close to the upper range of the market and 
the trend can easily continue and to open. There's no necessarily bad news coming out during the weekend to catalyze us to the downside. And until 550 is broken, basically continuing to buy the dips and continuing to look at higher highs, looking to break 555 this week and subsequently trying maybe to tackle 560 with CPI on deck definitely a possibility now jumping over to the nasdaq we can clearly see that we have a similar story right 48686 tongue twister there is going to be the rotationary point and nasdaq is pretty far stretched ahead so seeing some consolidation around the 496 number would not be surprising i would love to see a future push and then maybe a retracement back down or maybe we just say hey we're going to retrace down into cpi 48686 and then maybe on cpi day we catalyze to that level and then bounce right back up have a massive candle that's always a possibility again 48686 is going to be the point where i say okay none of the 476 26 number is in play until we close below 4686 if we wick down below that i'm okay as long as we're not closing there because that would signify that price is not being able to hold and thus we have to look for continuation to the upside i will definitely be taking more bullish trades until that number is violated and thus we look to see what's going on now here are some of the problems i'm going to give the bear some props in this that here's some concerns well first of all the russell being absolutely in a dog pile of crap right so the s p and nasdaq can continue to keep pushing it's all centered around and you're going to see it in the biggest winners and losers that's all centered in the six companies right all the gains are centered around the magnificent and six maybe tesla's coming back we did throw a video on tesla how now maybe they're making rockets because their stock went up 45 percent in a matter of two weeks make sure you guys check that one out and looking at this the iwm is in a territorial area that i'm just simply looking at this as a gigantic uh, bear flag forming right here hasn't been confirmed to the downside but is cpi going to be that catalyst is cpi going to be that one that's going to say hey this is going to send a lower drag the market down lower is s p going to reverse right all these things I'm keeping in the back of my mind when I'm taking these bullish plays because I'm like, I don't want to get completely cocky, right? I don't want to be like the bears that are basically saying it has to be this the same way I don't want to be on the bull side saying it has to be this. I'm looking at this and I'm basically saying that there is some cause for concern, especially with how the market's running so hot. On top of VIX being at these lower levels without having a major spike for quite some time. Now, the thing is, if you look here, we had a significant period without any major spikes, approximately 65 days. So if we extrapolate the same time frame, 65 days would bring us closer to July around the next CPI PCE report. So if we're saying that we're overdue for a VIX spike, yes, we are. However, it is not necessarily timed perfectly, and thus we could see a spike going into then. But again, I don't know if we are going to get that. And if we do, what's going to happen, right? So with that, guys, we're going to jump over to Bitcoin. And then last but not least, we'll talk about the commodities. And kind of like Bitcoin, when I mentioned this thing's probably going to see 50,000 beforehand or around that region. Well, we had a massive wick, but we closed below support. So I do believe Bitcoin selling off is going to continue going into the foreseeable week because it actually violated a 56,910, which it needed about $300 more to close above support. This would have been bullish, however, because you're closing below support. I'm saying that this trend is now going to continue and we're setting up basically an A to B pattern on the way down, which projects us to exactly 50,290. So again, looking at that 200 being the retest area, that's sitting right around 51,000 right now. So would I be buying Bitcoin and accumulating right now? Maybe not, right? If your dollar cost averaging, I would personally wait to 51,000. However, not to say 56,000 is not a horrible opportunity. However, you have to understand the risk that if you start breaking 50, then you need to get the you know what out because the trend is completely abolished and therefore the theory. You have to understand where you're wrong and when to get out. Understanding that risk, you can then say, is it worth getting in a 56 with the possibility of taking that loss from 56 to 50? Again, that's up to you. That's individual, again, not financial advice of what you're supposed to do, just theorizing what can happen. But with that, let's just cover the yields and crude, and then we'll jump over to the biggest winners and losers. Again, I talked about crude 83 close would be strong 
having a nice push up consolidating in that area. I would like to see crude just go sideways for some time. That would establish some bullish price action as we go. And one of the things that I was gonna talk about with Tom Lee is the dashed lines are the July, or sorry, the June transacted volume of crude. So thus, if we look a year ago to now, we can see that crude transacted for the entire month of July, or sorry, June, above that area. So that's gonna put positive inflation pressure on the CPI and why I don't think those expectations, and we'll get to that in the discussion part of the video, are gonna come to fruition. However, what I do foresee is this massive run into the later part of the market on crude, if we don't have something similar going into this year, that'll put negative inflationary pressure on the CPI report and thus cause inflation to trickle back down or start descending or falling like a rock, like Tom Lee said. We will keep you guys updated of this because I do believe he's looking at this and saying, hey, this is where majority of the gain in the CPI report is gonna come from. And he's expecting crude to just basically go sideways. I personally see a massive W pattern forming here where crude could easily hit $100 a barrel prior to the election. That's just a theory I have, especially with how OPEC treats crude, right? They want that $100 barrel. They've openly said it. So make sure you guys keep an eye on crude, not necessarily for the inflationary piece, just knowing what it is. It affects your daily lives, right? You fill up your gas car, you kind of need to know. And those massive draws on crude are a sign that, hey, maybe the oil market's not as predictable as we thought. And last but not least, taking a look at yields, right? Look, the 30 year just kind of going sideways forming maybe an inverse head and shoulders right here that you could possibly see here. So are we gonna see massive push on yields? Going into that, we can also see a larger possibly head and shoulders forming right here. So again, it's gonna be the tail of the head and shoulders just to see what it's gonna happen. As we can see here, this is a more clear head and shoulders on the two year, which should push the two year down lower and the 30 year higher, reinverting the yield curve, which is not necessarily a good thing for the broader market. However, it will be good for inflationary pressures because that means that we're kind of heading into the phase of the deflationary versus the inflationary and maybe getting rate cuts in the future. Not necessarily saying that's gonna be what everyone's gonna be cheering for when they get it. I'm just telling you what the theoreticals are on this two year looking like it wants to trickle back down towards this lower level. However, the inflationary report could completely invalidate this completely. And we'll talk more about inflation in the discussion part of the video. Fatal's gonna give you guys the biggest winners and losers, and then I will be back for the discussion piece of the video. So another week just finished and another week of all time highs when it comes to the S&P 500. As you guys can see right over here on the five day, the S&P 500 gained 1.69% with almost no time at all actually well, with very little volatility in general. And just as of Friday alone, guys, it gained 0.54%. The reason why this is important is because Friday was the day that we had job numbers. And job numbers really didn't move the market at all. However, after market actually opened, markets actually skyrocketed afterwards. Now, when it comes to the overall earnings, guys, earnings season is about to start very, very soon. In fact, we can already see it that it's going to start Friday. Nonetheless, though, for Monday, there's only one company, Greenbrier Companies. On Tuesday, we got Helen of Troy. I think that's the only one here that's actually prominent. On Wednesday, we got WD40, and uh, that's really is it. Thursday is going to be a pretty interesting day. Pepsi Delta, really interesting. And then Friday, we kick off the season of earnings with the banks, like always. JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, and Citigroup. We are going to have a live stream, guys, on Friday when it comes to these earnings as well as a little bit extra one on my end as well. More on that though later in the week. So let's take a look at now the heat map when it comes to the overall S&P 500. This was mainly buoyed up guys by of course none other than the tech sector, Tesla, and a few of the banks. So let's take a look at this technology sector. Worst performer here, it is none other than the company First Solar. You guys can see right there, losing 11.12%. And the best performer, it is of course in this um, in the chip manufacturer ones, it is the company on uh, ON Semiconductors, gaining 8.13%, but honestly guys, in general, anywhere in this whole entire sector except for micron of all things uh you were you did very very well overall now moving into the communications sector worst performer here it is the company disney losing 4.09 percent 
and the best performer overall, it is the company Paramount Global, gaining 15.11%. Looking into now the consumer cyclicals. Yeah, this did change a few uh, weeks ago, guys. Nonetheless, though, the worst performer here is uh, very easy to find. Nike, still losing this week, guys. 19.92%, 20% essentially. And the best performer, it is Tesla, gaining 27. Wow, I didn't even realize Tesla was uh, $251.52. 27.4%. Looking now into the consumer defensives. Uh, this one is, man, there really isn't that, that much movement here. Worst performer, it is none other than the company Keurig Dr. Pepper, losing 4.28%. And the best performer, it is the company Kroger, gaining 5%. The financial sector is definitely going to be one that a lot of people are going to be taking a look at, especially this upcoming week. More specifically on Friday because of the bank earnings. Worst performer here though seems to be none other than the company Everest Group losing 4.64% and the best performer overall guys seems to be none other than the company Synchrony Financial gaining 6.08%. Looking now into the healthcare sector, a lot of red here. This is now we're going to start seeing a lot of red guys. We got over here the worst performer being the company, uh, oh by the looks of it it does seem to be that one if you guys can see this one right here of course it's walgreens losing 7.63 percent and the best performer it's actually uh very easy to find it's a company baxter international gaining 4.15 percent looking now into the industrials very very 50 50 as you guys can see there's barely any green down here probably uh a, a rotation kind of style event nonetheless though worst performer here seems to be none other than oh let's see if i could actually find it seems to be this company right here guys quanta services losing 5.44 percent and the best performer overall is the company old dominion freight lines getting 4.84 percent and uh yeah that does seem to be the the biggest gainer in this whole entire sector looking now into the real estate sector honestly 50 50 as well worst performer it is none other than the company is that's actually a little bit difficult to find is the company sba communications losing 3.11 percent and the best performer seems to be let's see it is none other than okay it's uh it's it's this one right here uh ventus inc gaining 3.23 percent and the utility sector, it is also actually very much in the red. I was actually expecting that. We go over here, the worst performer being the company AES, losing 7.23%. And the best performer, it is done on the company CEG, Constellation Energy, gaining 3.18%. Something to note though, guys, is a uh, Southern Company. Zero. <laughs> Literally ended the week at the exact same price tag as it did as it opened. That's actually kind of hilarious. Wow. Looking now into the energy, guys, there's a lot of red here, a little bit of green here and there, but honestly, it's mostly red. We got over here, though, the worst performer being the company EQT, losing, if you guys can't even see that, losing is 2.58%, and the best performer seems to be the company Targira Resources, gaining 3.04%. And lastly, when it comes into the basic materials, worst performer here, it is the company Mosaic Company, uh, losing almost 8%, 7.93%. And the best performer, it is the company uh, Freeport McMorrin, gaining 6.62%. All in all, guys, as you guys can see, yeah, uh, a lot of red in general. The green's mainly consolidated right around this area, right? Right around this area. We'll see what happens this upcoming week on Friday. Again, we do have bank earnings starting, and that's going to say a lot about well, about Q2 in general, because we're now getting uh, Q2 numbers since we are currently in Q3. So with that said, that pretty much does it for this segment. Take it away, Mike. So I think we start off talking about job numbers and we'll talk about Pal and all his infinite wisdom this week that came out. So it's going to be a fun one. Infinite wisdom that's coming out next week as well. Yeah, so <laughs> it's gonna be a, it's, it's gonna be a fun one. But uh, we had a couple Fed speakers, nothing real crazy, but we had payrolls come in pretty nicely on non-farm, and then private kind of just like collapsed afterwards, and then yep. they revised the ones previously. Right, we had a previous one where it was 272 got revised to 218. We got 229 got revised to 193. So like you know, not as stellar as everyone yep. will believe. 
But to me, what was more important is the unemployment numbers actually ticking up again, right? Previously, we saw 3.0 to 4. Now we're 4 to 4.1. Technically, it was 4.057 or something along those lines. It rounds up to 4.1. But really? yeah, no, I covered this. Yes, uh, because I was watching this live uh, like on, on Friday when I was doing the live stream, I, I put on Bloomberg and uh, our favorite guy, the one that um, always grills Jerome Powell, he was talking and he specifically said, yeah, it's actually 4.05 something. So it just rounds up to 4.1. Gotcha. But uh, regardless, though, it's, it still has gone up, right? It still has gone up. It's just very, very small. Yep. Nonetheless, though, uh, the, 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 thing, the thing with all of this is, is that when this first came out, I was watching this live. It really didn't change futures at all. It only started moving upwards at market open. Yeah. They that was actually, the main issue. You actually got it like... It, it was like you didn't have any bad news. So it's like, okay, like checklist. Okay, job numbers come out. Were, was jobs catastrophic to us? No. Okay, no. Sec, second option. Have the bear shorted the market? Yes. It's a third, a third step. Uh, is the market going down? No. Okay, run it up. <laughs> it's right. like that. that's your checklist. It's literally like, okay, has anything bad happened between 9.30 and 11 o'clock? No, run it. It's like literally the recipe for the market. And it's just, we're back to the whole thing of like, does a, a good jobs report, quote unquote, good, right? Does that mean uh, soft landing incoming or does it mean that uh, no rate cuts coming? I don't know anymore. I just, I just think the market is in its own little thing of like, unless Jerome Powell comes out and says, you're all morons, which he's not going to do. He's just going to keep walking that line. They're going to find a way to twist it in their minds whatever they need to in order to force themselves to put the bullish trade on. Right. Right. So I don't necessarily know what's going to happen. You said that you don't know anymore. I haven't known for the past several months at this point yeah. because when is the narrative switching? And also, also something, something to note, uh, the fact that the fact that the non-farm payrolls got revised down yet, that's not the important part. It is the fact that non-farm payrolls today exceeded expectation. Yeah, it's like notice how, one green notice number. Notice how the revisions, right? Notice how the revisions uh, come out on the exact same time as per the, um, the as beats. per the new ones. Therefore, it kind of overshadows it. Nobody yeah, really yeah. pays attention everyone, to, the, to the revisions. Everyone's like, look at the green number, like look, look, the magician. Look at look at the pretty lady while I take your watch. Right, right. So, obviously. The main, the main thing that we can take from this is the fact that when it comes to uh, these job numbers, guys, most, not would say most, but there's a big, big chunk of jobs right now being made in the government sector. I mean, you even see over there, government payrolls, 70,000, up from, what is that, 25,000? Yeah, so 50,000 increase. 50,000 increase. So that's not sustainable, right? That's not, that's not su sustainable in the slightest. Is this something that we're going to see more and more and more, right? Because we have been seeing it more and more and more in the past. So when will when will it be the breaking point, essentially? When will the money printer stop printing money? That's essentially what you're asking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you well, can know, the government doesn't make anything, right? Yeah, just transfers future buying power to the current present. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, and this is where we get into the whole Tom Lee discussion, right? Mondays. Again, we're going to find out where the nest speculative positions are. I love how when they're like, the market's green, they don't publish it on Friday because they don't want to have all their friends saying, look at you dummies, right? Just, I got to love that. Uh, mm -hmm. We got Powell testifying on Tuesday, which should be interesting. He also testifies Wednesday. At this point, I don't think it's going to be a, anything. I think Powell knows how to walk the line so well that he's not going to slip up. What do you think? Yeah, I, I don't think anything's going to happen out of this. I think we're going to get more, much more volatility from the 11th as well as uh, the, the 12th. Yeah, so we got which, CPI. Yeah. They haven't have core published yet. However, I wouldn't be surprised if we get like a 3.1, 3.2 pairing, right? Have a core tick down 0.2, have CPI tick down 0.2 as well. Um, that wouldn't be, I don't think, crazy considering the last PCE report that we saw. Um, and Tom Lee may be right, right? Saying that inflation is going to start falling off a cliff, especially if oil starts to go sideways as we go into the period 
where oil's gone up last year, right? You know, countervailing uh, push. But right. do you think we're going to get the number, like the 3.1 number as they're expecting, or you think that it's going to kind of come in between? I mean, in between would mean 3.2, right? Yes, so essentially. I don't, I, don't, I don't know, because when it comes to oil, when it comes to energy specific for the month of June, at least here in Pennsylvania, I saw it all over the place, right? I literally have seen, I kid you not, I literally have seen movements in, and, and uh, you know, it's only one area where I'm seeing it. It doesn't mean that it's like this for the entire nation, but I've literally seen in June gas prices move up 20 cents overnight, 20 cents. Like I'm, I'm looking at this at like $3.45. It goes up to 365 the following morning. And then by the time I come home, it's at 355. I'm like, there was a total net swing there of like 30, 30 cents. Love how, how, is that, how is that possible? What, what, what's going on here? So I, I just do not, it'll really come down to energy, right? Energy has been the, I mean, for a while there, we saw energy in the negative. Remember that? Oh yeah. And then out of nowhere, it went spiked up to, to, to the positive. If what you're saying is true, that, um, I mean, if we take a look at, I really wish you could take a look at energy uh, throughout the year, like throughout the, like throughout the, like what it was a year ago, just energy, not CPI, but just energy alone. I really would like to see what energy was back in, um, what was it, June of 2023. I really am curious for that. I'm pretty but, sure we can't find it, but. Yeah, but to, to make a long story short, energy is going to be like the pinnacle, but it's also the question of do they start pulling stuff out of the report in order to favor uh, political sways, right? Do they start pulling out one thing after another in the report month over month to get the number they want? Right. Yeah, that's something that we also have to take into account as well. And um, we'll try our best to, to, to figure out what in the world, uh, if they took anything out, right? Yeah, they have but, to publish it. But, you know, everyone keeps it on the down low where right. like when they pulled coffee out, not a lot of people were talking about it. Not a lot of people realized it. Yep. Right. Not a lot of people realized it. So I don't I don't know. For all we know, for the month of June, um, CPI could come in with expectation at three point one. Yep. And that would make markets rally. And we also thing, do though. have yeah, uh, PCE as well, right? They don't have the expectations uh, PPI. yet. PPI. Or, yeah, PPI. PPI, sorry. Yeah, always always mess that one up. But uh, month over month, they're expecting basically flat, right? So I don't think this number moves as much as CPI. And I think the banks are going to move it way more on Friday, especially if they get bullish expectations like they are. They're expecting JP Correct. Morgan and Wells Fargo both to be bullish, and then Citi being the bear of them all. So we're gonna see how that turns out. Correct, yeah, I fully agree with that. Uh, but Thursday is going to be a massive volatile volatile day, in addition to then the following day, Friday as well, with all the, well, with the major banks, right? JP Morgan, Citi, and Wells Fargo reporting earnings. Yep. And let's just go through, you had a couple articles for me that you sent. Let's just quickly run th through them. Uh, so we got September rate cut, a strong possibility. What are your thoughts? I hope, dude, I really hope not. Right, I really, really hope not. That's the one thing that, I, that, I think that's the one thing that really separates us, this channel, from everybody else. Where everybody else is just like, we, we, we need rate cuts, we need rate cuts. I'm just like, you do not want rate cuts. Trust me, you do not want rate cuts. You need rates to keep going up for obvious reasons. Things will, yes, your, 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 your portfolio will shoot up a lot if we get a rate cut, but so will everything else. And the exponentiality of the other things rising in prices will not exceed your portfolio rising in prices. Yeah, you, can't, won't. You, you can't make as much money off your portfolio as you're going to eat through the inflationary pressures in the economy. Correct. Unless Correct. you're like a multimillionaire. But at that point, you really don't care. Don't care. Yeah. yeah. At that point, it really doesn't matter. I, this is what I was talking to my wife. I was, I was just like, I was just like, look, yeah, great. They cut rates. Guess what? Housing affordability, specifically housing affordability, will go from non-existent to a nightmare, right? Because at that point, it's like housing prices will go up. $200,000 overnight. Right now, the median housing prices are around like four forty-seven. dollars Within like a month or two months, which in the housing market, it is essentially overnight, it could easily be $600,000 as the median. Well, the euphoric nature, right? So you're, right. you're basically going to go completely bonkers with the euphoric nature of uh, housing. Right. Right. 
So that's kind of that's kind of where where I'm kind of heading towards this. It's just like no, we we cannot have a strong possibility of rate cut, of, of rate cuts at all. We cannot. We could not have rate cuts. Well, it's it's interesting you mentioned that, right? Because I covered this in the beginning part of the video, but I want to show you that if you look at the two year um, and simply on a larger time frame, it does look like you kind of have a head and shoulders forming right here. Now, mm -hmm. it's going to take a lot more time to complete. You're talking all the way into September, which would be around the rate cut time frame again. But what's interesting even more is that the 30 year kind of has an inverse head and shoulders forming here. So is it gonna cause the uninversion of the yield curve by the expectation of rate cuts? Is the longer run yields gonna stay where they are in order to basically just like keep a lid on that, like one foot in the door here, one foot in the door there, Whereas shorter term rates drop or are more volatile to possibly lead to the uninversion of the yield curve and subsequently unraveling. I'm not fully sure. It's Honestly, a theory I have. Yeah, yeah. I'm just I'm just letting you know that I just I'm not I'm just not sure. Yeah. Because at this point of the game, it's like it's like we're literally we are we are in a cycle and, and I mentioned this before. We're in a cycle of of CPI, inflation, rate cut. And AI, that's it. That's yeah, the I was going to say, you're forgetting matters. AI in there. Yeah, that's the only cycle that matters. So it's like the, the, this upcoming CPI number is the most important. Up until it happens, then it's the next one that's the most important. Nothing else matters. Oh, yeah. Nothing else matters. So but, will, will, this, will this cause an inversion of the thing? I don't know. But all I know is that when it comes to Friday, this past Friday that just passed, dude, I was seeing that 10-year fall, and I'm, I'm like, please, no. Please no, because the, the ten year is the the ten year treasury is the one that determines the thirty year mortgage. If oh. that ten year falls, if that ten year falls, that means that the that the interest rate for the thirty year mortgage is going to fall as well, causing the price of housing or causing the the, the interest rate on housing to fall. Right, uh, to fall, meaning the supply will begin to it's going to come down. Yeah, and supply is already constrained like it is, right? Now, yeah. you are seeing houses sit longer on the market, but it's just because uh, credit standards by banks are significantly higher. It's not necessarily that people aren't willing. It's just banks are like, yeah, we're not going to loan to you unless you have like an 800 uh, a FICO score and 20% down and this and that and like all these conditions, right? They're being very, very um, ca cautious in their loaning practices. Right. And I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that, by the way. Oh, yeah. I'm perfectly fine with that. It's just, it's just, I have a feeling that uh, if interest rates do fall by any means, and I mean any means, we are going to see an explosion, an explosion of demand when it comes to, um, like, I mean, I wouldn't even say we already have the explosion of demand. I'm just saying that we're going to get, like, you're going to get COVID. You're going to get COVID craziness again. A post, post, yeah. yeah. Post COVID yeah. housing market craziness 2.0 is what you're going to get. Yeah, yeah, fully agree. Fully agree. It's like you thought 100K over ask was insane. You probably do 150 to 200K over. And even and even now, there are still people doing like um, two thirds of houses. Two thirds of houses sell above asking. Yeah, yeah. Current in this market, right? Just fathom what it would be with rate cuts. No, forget about it. Oh, yeah. Any any form of rate cuts, it's over. And speaking of rate cuts, uh, Fed swaps actually price in two rate cuts by year's end. So they're pricing in November, December, right? And then they're talking about, okay, shift it to September, December, September, November. I personally think you're only going to get one uh, I, unless Tom Lee's right. And we basically see that inflation falls off a cliff. But I don't think you're going to get more than one, if any, right? I'm still in the camp of no rate cuts this year. I'm hoping for the same. I really am hoping for the same. By the way, I just looked up the uh, monthly supply of new houses in the United States, and uh, we are at 9.3. So Is we're at nine months? months, basically. Nine months? Okay. Nine months. A little bit more than nine really? months. Really? Like, when you think yeah. about that, like... But, but here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. It doesn't yes, account for okay. transactional volume. Well, not even that, right? Not even that. First of all, that, that's new houses, right? So assuming that that is real which i i let's just take it at face value it still doesn't take into account as to why houses even though as you said they're being longer in the market they're being longer you know 
you know, for, 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 for sold, yet prices aren't falling. Prices aren't falling. Why aren't prices falling even though you have nine months of inventory? Right? We've, we've had this lower, yet prices aren't, or sorry, we've had this higher, yet prices aren't falling. Because subsequent demand is uh, keeping pace, right? It's, it's like we talk about the balance of supply and demand. If supply and increases, but demand increases as well, it's just a nothing burger. Here's the thing, though. Here's the thing, though. That still doesn't take that into account. Because, uh, because I, an increase in demand, you would normally expect housing prices to go up, but it's not. So I think the reason is because there's no force, right? There is no force in in the economy right now, specifically in the housing market, to push people to forcibly sell their houses, right? That's the main reason why in 2007 and 2008, you had a, ma a massive housing crash because there was a force on people by the banks to be like, hey, you need to pay your mortgage and if you don't, we're going to foreclose on you. Yeah, the lock in right? effect now and everything keeping- uh, whereas, yeah. whereas now, whereas now, majority of people that, have a, you know, that, that have a house, what are they doing, right? What are they doing? They either have it paid off, so why would they take a 7% loan, right? Uh, interest rate loan on a house that they already, like for a new house, even though the one that they yeah, live never, in. That will never make sense. That will never make, make sense. And then the people that had just bought a house probably got it with a loan lower than 7%. Yeah. So why why would they why would they get one for a higher loan? It doesn't make sense. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Like there is no force. Sixty percent of homes are sub four point uh, interest rate, right? Um, currently, so literally your 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 pool of trans people that will transact is infinitely small with a very infinite amount of, um, and that goes both sides, right? So people that right. are willing to transact feeds the demand the supply side, right? Because they have to sell their homes to people that are in a similar situation that they don't care if they go from a 6.9 to a 6.8% mortgage, right? Yeah. They're still in the same equilibrium, but right. your pool of people that are willing to sell their house to then go somewhere else and then buy a house at that rate is all one very small pool. Very small, yep, very, very small. So that's why I personally believe that um, housing will not come down and this idea this idea that we gotta get rate cuts. We need we need two rate cuts this year, bro. You have people have no idea what they're asking for. They really don't. Well, it's like J.P. Morgan said, you people have no idea what on earth you're asking for. Right. And it's funny, and we'll conclude with this. I can't believe the Fed actually said this. Fed warns that valuations are high relative to fundamentals and major market classes. Haven't I heard that before? Haven't we been saying that for God knows how long at this point? Warren Buffett has been saying that the fact that, you know, stock market to GDP is massively overvalued. What other people say, no, nah, that, that's, a, that's a metric that we don't care about anymore because we're a world economy now. Yeah. It's like, bro, the you Fed mean, is now saying that. It's like, let's pile all the money into six companies. A oh, correction, one company, because 60% of the S&P gains are responsible by one company. I don't know what you need me to draw a bubble to define a bubble for you at this point because right. I like I don't know what in history there has never been a more like pitch perfect definition of a bubble than that. Like I challenge people, throw in the comment section if you know a different time where bubble like that existed, right? Because even dot com, it was centralized around dot coms. It was whole sector. Find me one company now. Right. Right now it's just one company. Right, I, I guess you could say, I guess you could say an entire an entire industry, right? The semiconductor industry. But yeah, it's really only just one company. It's really, it's really one, just one company. It's really yeah. one company. It's literally yeah, it's one really company that gained two point nine trillion dollars in market cap in eighteen months, surpassing surpassing Apple and Microsoft. Are they? Uh, who's the biggest now? I okay. believe. Let me let, let me look that up really quickly. Nvidia is three point zero nine. Apple is 3.4, so Apple's king. Um, Apple well, last or... time. So Nvidia, Nvidia moved down to third. Yeah, I Nvidia think... did move down to third, but Nvidia did surpass Apple there and, and Microsoft at one point. Remember that? Yeah, Apple and Microsoft yep. are neck and neck right now. Yep, they're off by like what five billion dollars, if I'm not mistaken. They're time. Yeah, it's a time. They literally day it fluctuates day to day. Right, but still though. 
Nvidia did overtake Apple and Microsoft. That was insane. Like a few a few weeks ago, which is just insane. It's just still, insane. Still, again, if you look at what Nvidia has achieved in such a short time, it's absolutely, it's incredible. But it's also like you're questioning bubble territory. Anybody? Well, it's it comes back to how much you're willing to pay for that growth, right? Yep. And that's what it really comes down to. So let's just end it with the fact that, uh, well, markets have been skyrocketing. And uh, what are we on the, on the fear and greed? Knocking on now? the door. Really? Really? So it could I be a, definitely time... a spicy one, especially going into CPI. Oh, yes. And earnings. And earnings as well. So that will be really, really fun to see. All right, guys. Well, that pretty much does it for this video. Make sure to like, subscribe, comment. It really does help with the algorithm on YouTube as well as Rumble. Make sure to follow us on X at Fiddle Investing. And if you would like to join our Discord, it is free. The link is in the description below. Regarding live streams, this upcoming week, we're going to have two live streams on CPI Day and Earnings Day. Uh, yeah, that's about <laughs> So Thursday and Friday, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on YouTube as well as Rumble. So make sure to subscribe on YouTube, follow on Rumble, set that notification, and be ready uh, so that way you guys, guys stop by and... Uh, and uh, you guys can see our reaction to the, the, the stupidity, the, the nonsense. I like to call it the nonsense. The CP lie. So, the CP lie, yeah. The lie. How, uh, so, how based is Trump as uh, JP Morgan going to be? Yeah. 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 I can't wait to see, I can't wait to see Jamie Dimon's uh, statements when it comes to that. He's, I can't believe I'm about to say this, but like, I, I can't believe I, 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 I agree with Jamie Dimon of all people. But guys, that'll pretty much do it. Thank you so much for watching. Peace out, and we'll see you all next time.